lift up our sister Marilyn Nugent and we ask that you would continue to heal her and nourish her with the promises of your word, give her comfort. We thank you for her faithfulness and her diligence in study and receiving the word of God. And we thank you for what a prayer warrior she is. And so we thank you for her and continue to pray for her health and continue to pray for the needs of her family. Father, as we look to your word today, we are aware that every time we meet is a gift from you. We ask that you'd help us to take this wonderful opportunity we have to be attentive to what God the Holy Spirit gives to us today. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, we are living in an amazing time, and I thank God for that. It's, a, it's really a fantastic time to be alive. Who, who would have ever thought anyone in this room? We've been around long enough that, uh, you know, back in the day, we never would have thought it, things would play out just the way that they are. Uh, but with the, challenge, the challenges that we face, we need to recognize our identification not only as individuals, with Christ and in Christ, but uh, we need to see our identification in terms of every single member of Christ's body. And I am identified as a member of his body like every other member of his body. And we need to stand for the doctrine that we receive as God the Holy Spirit conveys it to us, but we also need to not look for differences in uh, doctrine or doctrinal differences or other differences with other Christians, uh, but we do need to be gracious toward them and to recognize every single person as equal in Christ's body equal spiritual privileges and opportunities, no distinction between members in Galatians 3, 27 and 28, uh, addressing our baptism uh, into union with Christ. In fact, clothing ourselves with Christ, uh, Galatians 3, 27, 28. Now, as an example of... Uh, how we should behave, I guess, around other believers or think of other believers. As you know, I hold a dispensational position that is uh, rather uh, unacceptable to many dispensationalists. Uh, they don't like the mid-acts view, but I don't think pushing my dispensational viewpoint is necessarily going to be a valuable thing to my fellow believers in Christ during these turbulent times. So uh, while I'm fully capable of presenting the mid acts paradigm, I'm not bashful about doing it when the subject arises uh, ordinarily in my teaching. I've been teaching it for over 30 years now, but I make it my policy not to in any way marginalize those who differ with me, uh, both other dispensationalists and those who are not dispensationalists. I, uh, I, I realize I have a lot to learn from many of them, and I, I think of uh, J.D. Farag, I think of Gene Cunningham, uh, in my study, I think of J. Vernon McGee, I think of Lewis Barry Chafer, Charles Ryrie, uh, John Walvoord, and so forth. And 
Uh, so here's, I think, what we should be looking at is encouraging our fellow believers in the promises of God. And we find this throughout the New Testament, uh, including Paul's epistles. And we want to encourage one another with the promises of God's faithfulness, the promises of his provision, uh, the promises of his integrity. Uh, after all, when God made promise to Abraham, uh, because he could swear by no greater, he swore by himself. And there are promises in his word concerning his love, concerning his grace. And uh, in John 13, verse 35, By this all men will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. So it's important for us to actually step out of the natural, step out of our natural selves uh, and our personal problems and our personal focus and personal challenges and uh, step back and see the big picture regarding Christ's body and the privilege we have in being members of Christ's body. We're a, a member of a spiritual living and vital organism, the body of Christ. And every single member in terms of position and function is equal to every other member and to the head of the entire body in 1 Corinthians 12, though uh, we, may give, we may differ in the gifts we receive. We do differ in the gifts we receive because different gifts are uh, called for in the plan of God, but we all uh, function as edification to the body of Christ through our gifts. And can we step beyond ourselves and see that? That's the, that's the big question for us. It's essential to see our bond with other members of Christ's body. And we looked at some of that last week in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. God has designed it that way, and uh, we're headed toward the wrap-up of uh, the tactical nature of, of Christ's victory over the world. He has achieved the strategic victory. The tactical victory is coming, and uh, I believe it's coming very soon. And there are many unprecedented challenges which we face during these times. Uh, in the world today is like never before. It's always been there, but like never before is the mindset of the Tower of Babel, man's attempt to reach God through self-effort. And it's it's very rapidly heading toward its final and full expression, and nothing is going to stop it. Nothing can stop it, uh, save the second advent of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's going to stop it dead in its tracks and reverse it over uh, the 1,000-year reign of Christ and ultimately uh, wipe it out completely with a new heaven and earth. Right now we have Satan's grip clamping down on this world in a very intricate and very complex manner. Uh, and it's coming down in uh, layer after layer daily. Let's say several thin layers every day, every single day. Uh, we're, Satan's layers of tyranny are locking down on us. And uh, they are the blueprints that Satan has designed and, uh, and has handed human beings to build, build, build a system outside of God, a system totally apart from God, uh, totally 
rejecting God. And people like Klaus Schwab and Bill Gates are building their godless world system, uh, driven by their desire to be gods. And human beings, including Christians, are deceived about this. They're deceived about their agenda and the agendas of others who are building this godless world system. And Christians are deceived. They are fed demonic doctrine, and they consume it in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1. And they are fed by cosmocrators, demonic forces of this world, in Ephesians 6, verse 12. And many Christians very stubbornly and very ignorantly uh, entertain world movements that are not promoted by God, but are actually promoted by our spiritual foe, our spiritual enemy, the devil. And we're instructed to be undistracted by this world, to be undistracted by this age, and to fulfill our role in the plan of God. And we're exhorted to have our minds continually renewed by the word of God in Romans 12, verses 1 and 2. Now, in 2 Timothy chapter 3, we'll look a little bit at the nature of the warfare that the body of Christ is involved with during this present dispensation. And in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1, the Apostle Paul writing to Timothy, But I realize this, or rather, but realize this, that in the last days difficult times will come, for men will be lovers of self, lovers of money, boastful, arrogant, revilers, disobedient to parents, ungrateful, unholy, unloving, irreconcilable, malicious gossips, without self-control, brutal, haters of good, haters of good. And i just pause there a minute and mention uh, calling evil good and good evil. Isaiah 5.20, verse 4. Treacherous, reckless, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, holding, for, holding to a form of godliness, although they have denied its power, avoid such men as these. Now, the word form is the, uh, it's a word that is meaning the mere form or semblance. And the, uh, the word semblance, I, it's a word that I don't use, so I had to look it up uh, and at least make sure I kind of had an idea from context what it is. But it, in uh, Webster's meaning number one, it is an outward and often specious appearance or show. Or no, that actually comes from uh, uh, Joseph Thayer. And so Joseph Thayer, meaning number one, the mere form semblance, uh, Semblance is, um, again, oh, that is Webster's meaning number one, an outward and often specious appearance or show. Well, what's specious mean? Well, specious in Webster's meaning number one is having a false look of truth or genuineness. And then we come to this word that is usually translated godliness in the New Testament, uh, but godliness is not, godliness is, is very, uh, let's say, insufficient to actually describe the word. 
The word is Eusebius, E-U-S-E-B-E-I-A-S. And it means, well, it's from two words, right and worship, or good worship. And it means, according to Fritz Reinecker, an excellent German scholar, reverence that comes from true knowledge. It essentially is a synonym of the spiritual life of the believer. And the word power is dunamis, which means uh, often miraculous might or strength, uh, or often miraculous power. And in Second Timothy 1, verse 7, God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power, of dunamis, power, love, and self-control. All right, I'd like you to turn to Matthew chapter 14. We're dealing today with passages which are outside of the uh, limits of Christ's body but nevertheless are uh, practical principles for within the body of Christ. So outside the body's uh, dispensational context, but inside the body's uh, sphere of practicality. All right. Matthew 24, verse 1, Jesus came out from the temple and was going away when his disciples came up to point out the temple buildings to him. And he said to them, Do you not see all these things? Truly, I say to you, not one stone here will be left upon another which will not be torn down. As he was sitting on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately, saying, Tell us, when will these things happen, and what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? Now, Matthew 24 is a, a chapter I've taught over the past 30 years, I, I would say uh, maybe five times in some great depth, uh, I mean, giving this chapter attention for uh, many sessions in a row. And Jesus was destructing his disciples as to what to expect during Daniel's 70th week. And his disciples were to expect what Christ was describing and prepare for this time. And of course, what they did not know on the Mount of Olives that day is that, uh, and they were not permitted to know this, uh, God withheld it from them, but uh, they were uh, going to be uh, dead before these things actually happened. And by the time these things happened, there were going to be future disciples who would be the recipients of this information, and these future disciples are going to be disciples during Daniel's 70th week. We won't be there. But by the time that Matthew wrote, and Matthew wrote in the, the sometime during the 50s at the earliest, or uh, during the 60s, and Matthew uh, did understand by the time that he wrote, uh, he understood that the time that Christ described and that, that he was writing the, the quotes down from Christ, but he was, uh, Christ was describing a time that by the time Matthew wrote was, was projected into the future. And uh, if you go down and read uh, verses 15 and 16, 
Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation, which was spoken of through Daniel, the prophet, standing in the holy place, then you have in parenthesis, let the reader understand. Verse 16, then those who are in Judea must flee to the mountains. Now what Christ actually uh, quoted that day was from those verses, uh, or that is contained in those verses, was therefore when you see the abomination of desolation, uh, we know what that is, we've studied it, therefore when you see the abomination of desolation which was spoken of through Daniel the prophet standing in the holy place, then those who are in Judea must flee to the mountains. What Matthew inserted in that text was let the reader understand. In other words, when you see the abomination of desolation, let the reader understand. Let the reader during that time understand. So this was actually projected onto future believers and Matthew understood it by that time. If you have the red letter edition, uh, the parenthesis, let the reader understand, is in black font. And that is because Matthew inserted that. And this has now been forwarded to the disciples who are going to live during Daniel's 70th week. There's nothing in this chapter that is about Christ's body. In verse 4, And Jesus answered and said to them, See to it that no one misleads you. For many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and will mislead many. You will be hearing wars and rumors of wars. See to it that you are not frightened, for these things must take place, but that is not yet the end. Now, before the events in these verses I'm reading, before the events, we have trends described by the Lord Jesus Christ in Matthew chapter 24, trends which are going to be very much ongoing during Daniel's 70th week, but we do see these trends developing right now. They're all around us. They have been for years, uh, but they only intensify. They won't go away. They continue to intensify. And so verse 6, you will be hearing of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not frightened, for those things must take place. But that is not yet the end. For nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. And in various places there will be famines and earthquakes. We see a lot of all these things now. And uh, we, if we're here that much longer, we can expect to see more of them. Uh, we will not... Uh, see them like they will be here in Daniel's 70th week, along with a lot of other horrible things. In verse 8, But all these things are merely the beginning of birth pangs. Then they will deliver you to tribulation and will kill you, and you will be hated by all nations because of my name. At that time, many will fall away and betray one another and hate one another. Now, can you imagine this happening to believers? Uh, it, it, there's no reason to expect otherwise. You'll, people during Daniel's 70th week will be hated by both believers and unbelievers. And you as a believer in Christ today, if you're fulfilling the spiritual life, you are hated by both believers and unbelievers. And can you imagine believers spying on each other and turning each other in 
Uh, well, that's, that's what's going to happen. This scene is not far-fetched at all. And verse 11, many false prophets will arise and will mislead many. Verse 12, because lawlessness is increased, most people's love will grow cold. And this lawlessness is actually the lawlessness of uh, the people who reject God. It's not simple uh, civil lawlessness. It is a total rejection of divine principles. And as that is increased, most people's love will grow cold. Most people's. And that uh, would include unbelievers and likely believers as well during Daniel's 70th week. During Daniel's 70th week, people have the sin nature just like they do uh, during this present dispensation. And we can't expect otherwise from people who have the sin nature. They're going to, uh, they're going to fail. They're going to get uh, seduced by evil. They're going to be deceived, many of them. Uh, they will become deceived. In Matthew chapter 10, verses 34 through 36, the Lord Jesus Christ said, Do not think that I came to bring peace on the earth. I did not come to bring peace but a sword, for I came to set a man against his father and a daughter against her mother and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law and a man's enemies will be the members of his own household. That's the word that divides. That, that is not to say Christ uh, desires to divide families, but uh, the word of God does divide them, and that's a, that's a good thing because uh, the word of God is the standard by which the world is judged and the standard by which the world uh, certain in the world receives grace and mercy. And speaking of grace and mercy, if you're listening by recording today uh, <coughs> and you're not sure where you're going to go when you die, I need a, I need a drink. It's water, H2O. <coughs> You can have your eternity settled in an instant. Christ paid the penalty on the cross for your sins and for all of our sins. He died on the cross. He rose from the dead and he is available to save you by only one means, grace as a gift from God, an absolute gift from God. You can't do anything to earn it. You can't lift a finger to deserve it. Don't even try because uh, things get all mixed up when you do. And that's what happens to people who become religious and they think that their religiosity is going to save them. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. Is it that simple, you ask? Yes, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved and receive the assurance of that salvation from the Word of God, not from human beings who will tell you that you can lose your salvation or who will tell you that if you sin uh, enough and for long enough that you never really were saved to begin with. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you'll be saved and then rest in the assurance that God cannot uh, undo something that he has accomplished and declared as true by eternal divine decree. He who does not work but believes on he, him who justifies the godless, his faith is counted for righteousness. You are justified the instant that you believe on Christ. And that is a verdict 
That is a declaration that you are as righteous as God is. He who knew no sin, that is the Lord Jesus Christ, became sin that we might become the righteousness of God in him. You can't lose your salvation, but you need to be saved if you aren't. And it, if you're going to be saved, it's by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. All right, back to our lesson. In uh, Luke 12, verse 51 through 53, Christ said, Do you suppose that I came to grant peace on earth? I tell you, no, but rather division. For from now on, five members in one household will be divided, three against two and two against three. They will be divided father against son and son against father, mother against daughter and daughter against mother, mother-in-law against daughter-in-law and daughter-in-law against mother-in-law. And it's going to be horrible during Daniel's 70th week. We can see during this time the harbinger. And could Daniel's 70th week begin soon? It could begin very soon. And of course, we're going to be out of here before it begins. But consider five factors that's going to bring this on. All, all of them having to do with time. Time, number one, that's the special environment that God created for us. Number two, the devil's activity in time, which is providentially allowed for a time. And number three, man with a sin nature in time. Number four, the work of man's hands have developed in time. Uh, they have developed amazing technology in time, which is not evil. The technology is evil. The problem is not the technology. The problem is man. And uh, you can't expect that things would come out any different, uh, even though the prophetic word tells us so uh, by that we know, but who could expect things to end any different than the prophesied uh, word states because of the sin nature and because of Satan's evil, things could only go this way. And it's the uh, mindset of man today is fueled by Satan's arrogance and his desire to lift himself up and become like the Most High, and that has infilt infiltrated the human race in the Tower of Babel arrogance. And that's ongoing. It's going to come into full fruition during Daniel's 70th week. And number five, the prophetic word is certain for all time. And, uh, you know, uh, J.D. Farag said, I'm, I'm paraphrasing this, but if you, don't, if you don't think Daniel's 70th week is close now, then what more do you need in order uh, in order for you to believe it's close and he pointed out that he gives bible prophecy a lot of attention and i and there is reason for that and uh, i'm i'm glad he does he's a great teacher and uh, it's very, bible prophecy is a very important subject uh, in the, the Encyclopedia of uh, Biblical Prophecy, uh, there is noted that uh, there's a, about 20% of the Bible as predictive prophecy. And so prophecy is very important. I don't do newspaper exegesis, but uh, I've uh, gone over a lot of prophecy during the course of my uh, teaching career. 
You could turn with me to 1 John chapter 2. First John chapter two. And in first John chapter two, and we will start at verse fifteen. First John chapter two and verse fifteen. Do not love the world, nor the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the boastful pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. The world is passing away and also its lusts, but the one who does the will of God lives forever." So this begs the question, do you want to be a citizen of the world? Well, be careful what you wish if you do, because the world is passing away, as is described here. The world is passing away. And in Philippians chapter 3 and verse 20, our citizenship is in heaven. In John 16, verse 33, the Lord said, These things I have spoken to you so that in me you may have peace. In the world you have tribulation, but be of good cheer because I have overcome the world. So that's good news for us. That's uh, before the body of Christ, but that certainly is applicable to the body of Christ because uh, we are the body of Christ and it is the body of Christ and Christ has overcome the world and anyone who has believed on the Lord Jesus Christ is in the body of Christ anyone who has believed on the Lord Jesus Christ is saved once and for all and forever. Christ died for all of our sins and rose from the dead. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. Now, uh, we oft don't reflect the victory that we have in Christ. We are victorious in Christ's victory. Every believer of every dispensation shares in Christ's victory over the world. Believers of this present dispensation share in a very special way Christ's victory over the world as members of Christ's body. And often we, we don't behave like we are victorious. We don't reflect the victory in Christ that we have. And included in God's plan in the body of Christ, or for the body of Christ, is loving one another. That's for believers of all times. That was, that was, it was brought out in the law that, that the two most important commandments from God, uh, that the rest of the law depended on, was suspended from, uh, are love the Lord with all your heart and, you know, narrowed down in paraphrase and love your neighbor as yourself. And that's, that's for all believers of all dispensations. We have the capability to recognize and to operate in God's love much more during the present dispensation because uh, we have the completed canon of Scripture. We have the Pauline epistles, which show us the love of Christ. Uh, herein is love. Uh, actually, that's John. Uh, God demonstrates, this is Paul, God demonstrates his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Uh, we need to 
learn how to express God's love to others in practical ways, and we need to be willing to step out of ourselves in order to do this, because it, it is this is not accomplished in the natural. And we need to be willing to reach out beyond ourselves and look for opportunities to express the love of the Lord Jesus Christ both to unbelievers and to fellow members of Christ's body. Now, uh, speaking of John, turn to John chapter 15, the Gospel of John chapter 15. And actually hold your place there because we are at the time where we will take a 10-minute break and uh, I will close our first session with prayer before we have our break. Father, thank you for our time together. Thank you for your grace and mercy and your desire for us to make progress so that we can glorify you as we fulfill the wonderful life you've designed for us in your Son and through your Son's power. And it is in the name of your Son we pray with thanksgiving. Amen.